I couldn't really see your presentation. So, um, everybody, welcome Dave. Uh, he's a retired fire captain from uh, uh, Peoria Fire Department, and uh, he now speaks with uh, the Firefighter Cancer Support Network, um, Arizona okay. chapter, and uh, he's going to give us some, some really good knowledge today uh, of cancer prevention <laughs> risks. So, thanks Dave for having for being here. Thanks for having me. So, uh, you know, as I said, I'm from Peoria Fire. Uh, my career started in 1985 at the reserve in Chandler Fire. They had a reserve program back then. I wanted to see if I liked the fire service. Didn't take me long to figure out I did. And uh, eventually I got hired. I started in Peoria in 1989. So 20 years on the job, I ended up with cancer. And they put me in the office as our training captain. And that's where I started this presentation of cancer prevention. Uh, I'm now retired, and I now volunteer for the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. And that's what brings me here today. So, uh, surviving our career. Well, what used to be the big headline, the headline for us? What was our big concern in the fire service? Heart attacks. Heart attacks, MI, stroke, or uh, cardiac. We've kind of recognized that and we've acted accordingly. All our stations now have been built with, with workout rooms, workout equipment, stair climbers, treadmills, <coughs> stationary bikes, things like that. We're taking care of the cardiac. We're eating better in the firehouse. Older firefighters will tell you that diets change quite a bit. That's good. But... Now cancer is a bigger problem than cardiac ever was close to being. We're looking at epidemic numbers now of cardiac affecting, of uh, cancer affecting firefighters. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to, you know, if we don't talk about it, we don't have to worry about it. It's not the case. We have to talk about it. We have to meet this head on. And from what I heard of, of Verde Valley here, you guys are doing a very good job. So I'm more here just you know, double stamping why you guys are doing what you're doing, the reasons it came about. So I have several videos mm -hmm. for you. So we'll show those, kind of make it interesting. Uh, the class goes about two hours. About halfway through, if somebody wants to take a break, you know, I can start getting long-winded. Just raise your hand. We'll take a quick 10-minute break to uh, break it up. And by all means, if you have any questions, ask. As the situation takes place, the Boston firefighters are the first to get there, and we do our job, and we do it well. Somebody's trapped in that building with all that smoke and fire over there, you know. We're trained to save lives. We're trained to get the people out. I feel it is a calling. But cancer has taken the job I love away from me. just to commemorate my husband's life. Dick, my husband Dick was a firefighter in Boston for 36 years. My husband's name was Tommy Bell. He was a member of Ladder 17 for many, many years. Unfortunately, he died of cancer April 15, 2014. I'm here specifically for Willie Brown. Uh, we worked together for uh, you know, more than a couple of decades, and I miss him. Um, he's buried only a few blocks down from my all the brothers who passed away, you know, and a lot of them do it because of cancer. We are one big family, you know, where we out there doing our job, and this is what comes with it. It's killing our members. Simple as that. It's 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 the the one thing that is going to kill firefighters more quickly than a building collapse, more quickly than getting trapped. It's cancer. Well, chronic exposure to heat, smoke, and toxins is what's causing cancer in firefighters. Flame retardants are designed to prevent fire spread, but unfortunately will be found when they combust to give up these dangerous carcinogens. At a fire, you know, there, there could be nice, clear air, but all those chemicals that things are made out of, we're sucking that in, but you don't, you don't think about that. I have kidney cancer, it's grade four, uh, stage four, which is uh, the worst scenario. And then uh, recently I found out it metastasized into my, um, into my lungs. Both lungs. It's uh, incurable. The first thing that went through my head uh, when the doctor said I had cancer was that I'm going to die. And the question I asked him was, when? When I had to go to the hospital along with the commissioner and, and I saw uh, my friend, our friend, Billy Tobin, he said he was scared. He was scared to leave his family, his wife. I grabbed his hand and squeezed it. And I says, Billy, it's time.
time for us to take care of your family. We crash through walls, we walk through fire. But when you see a brother or sister firefighter in, in the deathbed, I cried that night. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I, I know everybody on this wall. I, I know everyone whose pictures hang, hung behind me. And it's, it's devastating. And we've, we've buried way too many of our friends. It's unacceptable that Boston firefighters have two and a half times the rate of cancer than other Boston residents. It's unacceptable that Boston firefighters are come down with a cancer every three weeks. It's unacceptable that 20 Boston firefighters every year develop cancer. I have brain cancer, and I also have stage four lung cancer. We never talked about cancer in the firehouse when I was there, and maybe I didn't wear my mask then when I should have. You need to wear your mask. That's the message I want to deliver to all Boston firefighters right now, is that you need to keep that mask on your face, and you should be thinking about your family when you go to take it off. All of these guys were somebody's husband, father, grandfather. Think of your own children and your families. They want you around. Wear your mask. I don't only speak for myself, but the guys behind me on that wall uh, who would say, um, you know, use what, use the equipment they're giving you. Be as safe as you possibly can be. Uh, the macho crap about um, you're covered in uh, soot. And, you know, you look like you went through the ringer. You know, what you could take, what your body could take, and there's nothing macho about cancer, so. These guys, you know, give everything they have to the job, so they really deserve the, the, the support and the protection. Looking at the wall, there's so many faces on there of guys that we've lost. Um, there's so many more that are sick, so it's kind of a, a wake-up call. I don't want to cry ever again knowing that I'm going to get a phone call or be that by his bedside. But if the commissioner and the union, along with the Mayor Walsh, can stop that down the road, we've done our job. It's not that we don't want to talk about it. It's that we know it's there. And talking about it makes it real. We need to talk about it. I'm here to commemorate my father, uh, Bill Hayhurst, District Chief in Car 4. John Fogarty, letter 23. John Kenny. The captain of Engine 24, Grove Hall. Joseph Mullen on Engine 8. Billy McCarthy of Rescue 2. Bob Kilduff Sr. was on Ladder Company 23 and passed of occupational cancer. My name is Jenny Flynn, and I'm here commemorating my husband, Frank Flynn. The numbers are terrible. Boston's got a new cancer diagnosis once every four weeks. Uh, would you believe there's other departments who would love to have that kind of numbers? Miami-Dade in Florida, it's a big department, 2,000 members. Right now, 34% have cancer. You're talking 700 firefighters for one organization. And they've broken their cancers down. We'll hear them talk about it a little bit later. They've been broken down to, like, for example, brain cancer, 17% of their fatal cancers. <clears throat> Majority of their guys have skin cancer. And in Arizona, we're not immune to this, not as firefighters. In Arizona, 20% of the population gets skin cancer. So it's something we have to be aware of. You heard in the video that they talked about if the mayor and the commissioner and the union do their job, well, then they're going to be okay. The point I'm going to get across today is it's about individual accountability. Boston's looking at, I mean, Boston's a great organization. You know, I don't want to criticize them at all, but they're missing the point here. It's individual accountability. It's not up to the mayor. It's not up to the chief. It's not up to the union president. It's up to you. If you want to be cancer preventative, the first person you got to look at is yourself. It's individual accountability to be cancer preventative. The responsibility is on the company officer. But it's individual accountability. And that's the point I want to get across throughout this whole presentation. You're responsible for what you do. So what's covered today briefly is, is what is cancer and why are we so exposed to it or predisposed to having it? Uh, why it deserves our attention, detecting it, contributing factors, and finally what we can do about it. The first study to establish a link between firefighting and cancer was a study out of the University of Cincinnati, Graceland Masters. This is the base of foundation, baseline of the foundation for all the other studies that have come next, come after it. 
the evidence there is overwhelming that our job can lead to cancer. The insurance agency or the insurance industry is still fighting this. We've shown that the, you know, the collusion with it, the evidence is there that, you know, so many guys, why are we getting on the job here? But they want the causation. The insurance company has broke it down. Workman's comp has broke it down. I want to know which fire and which exposure led to your cancer. And that's the fight we're facing. Anybody that's diagnosed with cancer going through the workman's comp process, how in the world can we decide that? So that's the fight we have if you have to try to make your cancer uh, work-related. Mm -hmm. So what is cancer? In its simplest form, it's a growth of, of abnormal cells. They don't follow the normal cellular process of dying and then regenerating in a, the way our bodies usually work. So you get this unusual growth of cells that can start growing and they don't die. That's the simplest form of cancer. There's different types of cancer. There's carcinomas, sarcomas, leukemia, lymphomas, and in cancers involving the central nervous system. And generally, there's approximately a 10% chance that your cancer is based on your genetics. In other words, the other 90% of cancers people get is from an outside exposure. Maybe what they ate, or what they breathed, or what they absorbed. <coughs> and as firefighters, we are kind of the highest, short of people working in the, in the chemical industry. We are exposed to uh, carcinogens on every single fire we go on. And the policies and procedures we have in place, we even have exposures where we're not even out of fire. For example, I, didn't get, I tried to get here early to your station, but I didn't look inside your truck. Are your SCBAs in the cab? So why are we taking exposure on a EMS call? You guys have a policy that when you come back from a fire, you take your turnouts and put them in a compartment. We don't want them in the cab, right? But yet we still have the SCBAs in the cab. 30 years ago, it was unheard of to have the SCBAs in the cab. It took them to design these seats where the SCBA would fit in the cab. And all of a sudden, we got this great idea. Now we can get inside a fire faster. We love this. We're taking the exposure for no reason. And I know the law is... The longer you've been on the job, more likely this has occurred. When you come to work in the morning and do your truck, your equipment check, your SCB, if they had a fire that shift before, unless that shift before was B shift, then maybe the fire was on A shift. B shift didn't tech it. <laughs> but you come to work and look at your pack, and it's not in the ready state you would have liked. We've all been there. Maybe extra insulation on or whatever it is. We know. On our own admission, we don't leave these packs in the condition we should for the oncoming crew. So just something to think about. Our top 10 deadliest cancers in the United States, pretty straightforward list. Lungs number one from tobacco. There's no way around it. The evidence is overwhelming that tobacco use, whether it's cigarettes or, or chewing, leads to cancer. The ones you see in red here, well, let me go with number two, colorectal. You want to prevent the number two cancer in the country? Get a colonoscopy. Insurance says you should have that done at 50. Health directors in the fire service, you need to have that done at 40. How do you get that test performed at 40? Meet with your private physician to explain your, your, the hazards of your job and you need to have a colonoscopy done now. If I've got 15 years on a job, I'm 40 years old, I'm due for a colonoscopy. And meet with your doctor and say, how can we get this approved so insurance will cover it? Rule out irritable bowel syndrome, rule out diverticulitis, rule out bloody show when I wipe. Whatever the case is, get the colonoscopy done. Once you've managed to get that done at 40 and your private insurance covers it, then you can have it done again because they're going to recommend it in the next three to five years depending on what they see. And if they get, you get that procedure done, they can nip off a polyp before it becomes cancerous. And you just take it away the number two cancer in the country. But we're not really happy to go and get a colonoscopy done. It's bad enough we get our physicals. Does real Verde, real Verde, man, shoot me. Verde Valley, you have a physical, a year with physical, correct? Um, is that just a special one? Do you go to your own doctor for that, or do you have a special facility you all go to? Yeah, we have a special facility. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, number three, breast cancer. It's number three highest cancer in the country, yet it predominantly affects only females. There's a lot of females being affected by it to make it number three. That's why it's got such high or such a broad fan base. You know, there's so many fundraisers for breast cancer. The NFL supports it. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. 
You know, if this cancer is going to find a cure, my money's on breast cancer. It's got the most money going to it, so that's kind of cool. You know, cure one of them, then we can start the path. Uh, the ones you see in red, colorectal leukemia and lymphoma, are part of Arizona's current cancer presumptive law. This is a busy slide. I couldn't break it up. If you look on the left side of the slide, left side of the slide, you'll see the seven cancers there: brain, bladder, rectal, lymphoma, leukemia, adenal carcinoma, and mesothelioma. That's our current cancer presumptive law. And the law that we have came into place after Brett Tarver's death. You guys remember that fire, 2001, the flag food fires in Phoenix? Terrible call. And we got to see it live on TV, Bruce Hafner in a Channel 3 helicopter. Just devastating. I still can't get that out of my mind seeing him pulling him out of the building. But that fall, the legislature came in. It came into the PFFA, and we got this on the books. That being said, it's not strong legislation. If you all saw the story of Gilbert Martinez from Goodyear Fire Department, he has leukemia. 16-year veteran of the department, he was diagnosed. He submitted his paperwork for workman's comp. Guess what happened? He denied it. Denied it. One, two, three times. Their insurance carrier for Goodyear is Copper Point. And Copper Point, when I went to a, a state <clears throat> Senate or House Representative meeting, the president got up and said, we deny everything. You prove it. They've taken all the emotion out of it completely. For them, it's down to dollars and cents and, cents and profit. A law backing it up is, it's, his job leads to it, and they're denying it. He sought legal uh, uh, representation out, and he's still having this issue to try to get it approved. Luckily, he's been remission. But the good news is, if you look at the other side of the list, we are trying to change the current cancer presumptive law. Uh, I'm working with the PFFA, you know, our union representative at the state level, and we want to add these 10, I'm sorry, these 12 additional cancers to the current cancer presumptive law. And we've gone through a couple committees for the House. It went through the House. It passed. Uh, yesterday, we had a Senate subcommittee for uh, Commerce and Public Safety. It passed 6 to 2, and now it's on to the Senate floor. When it gets through there, then it'll be, it'll be our new law. I don't know when that's going to happen. There's a lot of bills that the legislature is going through now. But to add these other ones, and what's interesting about the list that I really like is you look at it, skin, testicular, and most importantly, prostate. We're going to have coverage for that now. So I can't tell you how excited it is to have this go through. And also, we added another bill to it, cardiac presumptive law. So now we're going to have cardiac presumptive as well. Our guys are getting a heart attacks while they're still on the job are now going to be covered. So this is really good news. And you ever get a chance, Brian uh, Jeffries was the president of PFFA. It's his number one priority. He's worked hard for this. In fact, the whole state uh, representation has. So it's kind of cool that's going to be coming out. I think it's going to pass through the Senate. I don't see an issue with that. So there's different ribbons for different cancers. It's not just pink for breast cancer. Everybody's got their own identity. And I told you I'm a cancer patient, so my favorite color ended up being orange because I'm a kidney cancer patient. Uh, a couple lessons to be learned from my diagnosis is I have chronic back pain. Come and go for over two <clears> years. <throat> and I have my annual physicals through the Phoenix Health Center for Phoenix Fire Department, and I complain of the back pain during my physicals. And their, react, their reacts or response to that was you need to exercise more. You need to stretch your lower back muscles more. Take care of that back pain you have. That was their answer. And I listened to it. He's a doctor. Why should I question the doctor? Do we ever think that there's a problem with us? We want to keep seeing doctors till we get the worst news we want to hear, we don't want to hear? Absolutely not. The doc told me I need to stretch, so I listen to him. But I'm at work checking off the drug box one day, and somebody came up to give me a kidney tap just to say hi, and it's excruciatingly painful. I mean, I was holding on to something that wouldn't pass out. I don't understand why it hurt so bad. I knew he didn't hit me hard. It took me a minute or two to recover. Everybody's talking about the mornings, what they did on their days off. Life is good. We're all happy to go to work. Finish my shift, nothing out of the ordinary, you know, or eight to ten calls a day. And when I went home, I was urinating blood. Is that a big concern as a firefighter? Yes. Even if I took a punch in the back the day before? Yep. Majority of the guys will say it's not a big deal. I'm going to drink a lot of fluids. If my urine clears up, is there a problem? Most guys will say no. And I was one of those guys who went that route. I don't want to say there's worst case scenario. I had a doctor said I needed a shrink in my back. Well, about five days later, the pain got worse than I could handle. So I go see a urologist. Why? Because I got left flank back pain, 
What's wrong with me? Kidney, kidney stone or kidney infection until proven otherwise. That's what I'm thinking. Who's best to take care of that? A urologist, not my family doc. So I go to see a urologist. The first thing you have to do is pee in a cup for a urologist. And it showed I still had microscopic bloody show in my urine. So now it's off to a CT. I get a CT done first thing in the morning. My urologist calls me himself a couple hours later. He says, Dave, you need to come in. We've got to have a talk about the results. I have any patients, come in anytime you want this afternoon. And I blew it off. I said, you know, at the time, I was an avid bicyclist. I'd go to this, my assignment as a roving captain. I'd go up to Lake Pleasant, Station 199. I worked there during the day and because it was only a daytime station. And I'd go work somewhere else at night. If nobody was off, then I stayed at the lake. So my PT at the lake, I had my mountain bike there. I would be riding a mountain by the firehouse, by the fire station. There. I thought life was great. Winter time, I'm protecting fishermen. This is easy duty. Pinch me. I can't believe I have this assignment. And in the summers, to be there a little longer, got a little busier. But uh, Doc tells me to go to Thunderbird and pick up a copy of the films and bring them into his office. I blew them off. I didn't want to go in that day. He goes, that's the best we take care of this. And I said, okay. So I go to Thunderbird, pick up the films, and I can sign a waiver to get the radiologist's report. You don't think I'm not going to pick that up too? Heck, I want it all. So I picked up the radiologist's report, got this nice big vanilla envelope, all this information. I go back home and I read it, the radiologist's report. I didn't look at the x-ray. I couldn't read it anyhow. But I read the radiologist's report. It told me I had renal cell carcinoma. And it listed the size of my tumor, which was roughly a youth football. My cancer had been growing for over two years. <clears throat> Onset of finding me out, I finally have cancer, I am stage three. The abdominal CT showed that I have this tumor mass, I have a non-functioning kidney, it's just a tumor mass, and it already metastasized or spread to both of my lungs in the bases, because that's all abdominal CT will show. So I've got a problem. And what did I do? I've been no exposure to anybody with cancer. No exposure, I had an aunt on my mom's side who died of lung cancer when I was younger, but she smoked, I think, a carton a day. I didn't want to, you know, as a younger kid, it'd be near her, it just stunk. I didn't want to be anywhere near her. It was terrible. And no one else in my family had cancer. No one else in the fire service had cancer. And I read that in my report, my name had cancer, and I freaked. Like that first guy in the video, I said, I'm going to die. And I, even had, I didn't ask the doc when, I just felt I'm going to die. Life is over. I got a 12 and a 13-year-old kids at home. I freaked. I, pan I hit the panic button. I called my wife at work, told her I'm sick, I have cancer. So we give you a lot of lessons throughout my lecture here and through my ordeal. Don't do that. Don't call your wife at work and tell her you got a problem. Because <laughs> she came home right away and she was very upset. First of all, I was sick, but she wasn't very happy the way I told her. Not in person, didn't go to her office or anything else. And I could have cared less about her feelings. I was thinking, I'm in trouble, I'm going to die. All you've been doing, given is some information of an issue you have to face, whether it's you, your spouse, or your kids, or your parents. It's something you have to face. And with that in mind, you put on the brakes. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to tell anybody anything. I don't have to tell my captain, I don't have to tell my chief, I don't have to tell anybody. Find out how bad a problem it is. Find out the solutions to take care of that problem. In, in our world, it's your worst hazmat call. So that's really what it is. We're going to take a slow, methodical approach to this and see how we got to deal with it. Let people in to your secrets as you need to. You know, if it's work, if the first thing you got to do is your job here is probably fill out, you know, a, a family leave paper or whatever, you know, extended leave. And when you fill that out, depending on your department, you maybe not have to tell your chief or your captain. It's just have them tell you human resource. So different variations there. But the point is, is put the brakes on and deal with your problem. All right, there's no reason to start screaming, oh, oh I got cancer, what am I going to do? Because I let everybody know. I freaked, and it's not the way to go through that. I got online, looked at the Cancer Center of America. They're one of the big players in the Valley. The other two is MD Anderson and Mayo. Cancer Center of America, they're bragging with these results here. I'm advanced kidney cancer. They're bragging that if I go with them, I got a 44% chance of living 12 months. Less than one in two. And they're bragging that if you look at the five-year plan, Five years out, we're looking at 10% survivability. They are bragging with these numbers. In my, when I met my urologist, he already had me scheduled for surgery 10 days out. The date of being diagnosed with cancer, which is April 22nd, 2011 for me, and 10 days to go for surgery was an eternity. 
Because as far as I was turning this can, now that I know I had it, it's doubling every day. And the doc's saying, just, just relax. It's not going to change in 10 days. It's been growing for over two years. Well, that didn't commute with me. I want this out as fast as you can. I'm thinking alien, got the little monster that's going to come out, this kidney cancer monster. So it was eternity to get scheduled for surgery. But he told me I had to find an oncologist because I will have to be treated for cancer. Surgery is the number one treatment for kidney cancer because you have two kidneys. You can survive with one. But I would have to see an oncologist because then he told me it was in the base of my lungs. So I looked at the, the met with two independent oncologists. They didn't give me warm, fuzzy feeling, but at least I started getting some information of what I was going to be facing and what, kind of, what I needed an oncologist. They said the number one treatment choice after surgery is chemotherapy. And the type of chemotherapy is high-dose immune therapy. And if you look at the graph here for that, the patients that they have to have it, if you look at 12 months out, man, we're almost 60%. That's far better than 44 here. And if you look at five years out, we're almost at 20, probably 19%. Well, that's far better than this. So if I got to have it, great. I guess there's better treatment out there, the Cancer Centers of America. Now, let's first let's do the surgery. My surgery... Uh, my incision starts in my right rib cage, up to my xiphoid, down the left rib cage to here. So this is how they, much they open me up to get in the retroperitoneal cavity. Interior approach to hit that kidney or that tumor to take it out. So if you can imagine, that's quite an incision to recover from. A week in the hospital, uh, I was discharged and I was back in. I threw a PE, dealt with that for another three days in the hospital when I was sent home. I show this bottom picture. That's a deputy chief, a battalion chief, and union trustee. Our union president, Joe Manning, visited me every single day I was in the hospital, wherever I was in the hospital. Under, under, understatement commitment. Understatement commitment. It's amazing what the union can do for you. I had support from admin and from union, from the city hall, from human resource. I had support from everybody. And maybe because my wife worked for the city as well, uh, that support was there because they knew us. But... I went home to recover for a month after surgery, had another, now I had a chest CT and showed the cancer was throughout my lungs. Borderline stage three, stage four. The small tumors, they can't even count how many are in my lungs. They have six marble sized tumors from a small marble to a large marble. So I've got to do the IL-2 treatment, which is a treatment that sucks because there's a 20% mortality to the drug. They've lowered mortality numbers because now they have benchmarks that you have to meet. You have to prove you're healthy enough to receive the dose. Well, I was a firefighter. We're all healthy enough to receive the dosing. We can handle it. But I had to see a cardiologist and a pulmonologist to prove I could withstand the treatment. The treatment involves you check into ICU, and they give you a dose every eight hours, maximum 15. And you have to, they have to have you in ICU because they make you that sick. Their goal is to keep pumping this drug into you till an organ shows signs of failure. They don't know which one. They are kicking your immune system into overdrive to fight everything. What your immune system produces in a lifetime, they give you in a dose every eight hours. Overnight, my body fought off, thought I was sunburned. I, I sloughed off the first layer of skin like a sunburn. Overnight. Overnight, my whole face cracked, repealed, and then cracked. My whole face was bleeding. Woke up in the morning, I got just a smile and any type of facial feature that you might move a muscle was painful. It was unbelievable what I was going through with this. And I'm starting to burn through sick hours fast. Surgery, one week in the hospital, home, another half week in the hospital. Well, there's two weeks of sick leave. Then I had to help them recover another week. There's three weeks of sick leave. This treatment, one week in the hospital for it, and you do two weeks home recovery and back in. So every hospitalization is two more weeks of sick leave. I'm burning through hours. I burned through 600 hours before I even <clears> blinked. <throat> I asked guys to do trade shifts. We call them AWRs. Guys, more guys signed up than had shifts available. The support of you is unbelievable. So I went through five cycles in the hospital this, the fall of 2011. Three, you know, one weekend, two weeks home. The third week I go to work light duty. In between the second and third visit in the hospital, I've got to, I've, they're making me as sick as they can. Side effect is in, in, as a, Insomnia and depression. So you stay all, all night feeling sorry for yourself. Beautiful combination. I still felt I was going to die. And I wanted to get such extra money for my family. Because you guys know, maybe you don't, 
through our public safety pension, a 20 year career is 50% pension. Do you guys know if you pass away, your spouse gets 20% less? That's why our pension is set up by law. I'm not prepared to give my wife roughly 40% of the pension I earned after 21 years. So I went after disability. I wanted workman's comp. I wanted to go after just disability. Disability in our wage area is 2,400 bucks <coughs> a month. And now I got to, since I have to hire a lawyer, I'm looking at 1,600 a month. I can die if I'm gonna give my family that additional money. You know, even though my wife works, you know, I always felt I'm the breadwinner, man of the household, insurance will come out of my check, all this stuff. <clears throat> I just wanted to still provide. If I can get them 1600 bucks a month after I pass away, I did good. That's all I was looking at. So I met with a lawyer. I met with Brian Moore through Phoenix Fire. He recommended an attorney that handles workman comp claim for public safety employees. That's all he does. So I met with him, and he did not give me a good feeling. He said, nobody has won a non-presumptive cancer claim. Remember the seven cancers that are covered? Kidney's not one. So nobody's beat that. He goes, it's always got to be a first. He goes, the odds are extremely against us. You will cover my cost. And if we win, I'll take a third of your check. I don't care. As firefighters, if we are right, will we go against anybody with our convictions? We will. This is who we are. So I said, I don't care what sign. So I signed him up. He represented me. First thing he did was subpoena people to fire for my training records. Man, we got to keep track of that. NIOSH, OSHA, all that stuff. ISO, training records, no problem. We already provided those. Next up was all my physicals through Phoenix Fire. No problem. They got those from the Phoenix Health Center, 22 of them. No questions asked. I didn't have to prove it at all. It's not my information. I'm just the subject. You guys, for your annual physicals, here's another lesson. You fill out paperwork prior to your physical, correct? Of any changes that occurred, any exposures, what you do off duty. What you volunteer on that form can be held against you. For example, if you ever put on a form that you smoked or you chewed, you just occluded yourself from having any type of protection of an airway cancer. It's in our presumptive cancer law, the old law and including the new law. If you smoked, any airway cancer is caused by tobacco use. You can't fight it. You volunteered that. If you volunteer that, you know, how much you drink off duty, you can't take that information back. It, and, you know, you're evaluated and whether you're a good employee of what you do here on the clock. Why volunteer if you have 10 beers a month off duty? That's your business. I'm not telling you to lie in your questionnaire, especially if I'm being videotaped. Don't lie. But don't volunteer what you don't need to give. It can only be held against you. It's not going to be held for you. If you want to have that one-on-one -on -one patient confidentiality, you don't do it with the physician your city has hired. You do it with your personal physician. That's where the confidentiality kicks in. Okay? So they got my physicals through Phoenix Fire. Next up was exposure reports. The number one tool, the number one tool we have in our arsenal to, to validate cancer on the job is exposure reports. And so they subpoenaed Peoria Fire for my exposure reports. And how many did Peoria have for my 20-year career? 25. Five. We had five. 20 years, the five. I guarantee I had more than five just in the academy. That wasn't enough. So, but we've been on Phoenix CAD as long as I've been there. And we started with the MDTs, mobile data terminals, just tiny screens that just gave you minimal amount of information. And then we went to the MCTs, computer, mobile computer terminals. And with that, Phoenix had a set of mass buttons on the side where you could fill out an exposure report for the incident. But we had no formal training on that in Peoria, but we saw this available just by farting around looking at the screen, and we started using it. Word of mouth, we started filling out exposure reports in every fire we went on. And my chief knew we were using that, so he called up Phoenix Fire and said, can we have the exposure reports for David Ranke? This is back in 2011. And guess what Phoenix Fire said? Sure. We will need the incident numbers, though. Because Phoenix Fire, their files were set up that was tracked by the incident number. They could not do a search by your name. Fast forward now, Phoenix now changes that. When you, if for the Valley, Metro Valley area, if they did an exposure report, Phoenix Fire sends that report to the, the, to the corresponding department the next morning. So what the Valley departments are now looking at, who's receiving that information and what are they doing with it? So that's important because you have to track the exposures. 
So we had back to square one for PRs. What they did is now we always have people on light duty. The organization always has somebody on light duty, right? There always seems, seems to be somebody getting a knee, elbow, shoulder, or something. Well, in Peoria, now those people who are now going through, because half my career were used logbooks. And now they're going through the logbooks. Those are government records. You can't throw them away. So from every year, we collect them from the stations and store them at admin. So now people are going through those log, old logbooks. And any given station, on any given shift, and it's always working, if the information validated it, they create an exposure report. So now behold, now they provide my attorney. I have 2,000 exposures for a 21-year career. Is that a difference? Yep. Oh, yeah. So much so that when I was interviewed by the doctor, this work was, the state hired, workman's comp hired, that was the mat mathematical equation to help me win my verdict. 2,000 exposures over a 20-year career led with my personal uh, medical history led to a high probability my cancer is work-related. I won. My human resource for Peoria said I'm the first firefighter to challenge the state with a non-presumptive cancer claim and win. Somebody told me I'm the second. What I can tell you, what I've heard word of mouth today is four firefighters have won a non-presumptive claim. Flagstaff, Sedona, Peoria, and Tucson. They have challenged workman's comp with a non-presumptive cancer and provided enough evidence to win a claim in their, in their uh, favor. So am I a winner? Am I lucky? Am I fortunate? Heck yeah. Because after five cycles in the hospital, I was declared in remission. The fifth cycle, I threw a subclavian clot. I went home to recover from that. Started up Lovinox and Coumadin. Eugene, or, res, or regiment. regiment. Thank you. And a month later, I get my chest CT. All the small tumors are gone. The six marbles are shrinking. They declared me in remission. I was so beat up and so ready for the doc to keep telling me bad news. I'll keep taking it. As sick as they made me in the hospital, I never, ever said stop. And I guarantee each one of you would be the same way. It's our nature. To be successful on this job, we really are a lot alike. We're not going to quit. We don't quit. Tell me the last time you quit on a call. Tell me you had the opportunity to quit on a call. It's not in our DNA. It's not in our nature. We don't do that. And I didn't do it through my treatment. First three rounds, three visits in the hospital, I went A-lock. That stopped the dosing. Fourth one, I... I went in AFib, stopped the dosing, and the fifth time I threw a subclavian clot. But now I'm in remission, and I won my court case. And I was so short-sighted, I didn't realize that winning my case, it's, it's, it's all work now. The minute I won my case, the money I was out of pocket for my care, which was $13,000 in co-pays after 18 months, I mean, I had great insurance. I'm out 13 grand. I won my verdict. I had to pay my lawyer 12 grand. I won cost me 12 grand to win. But the odd side, the, odd, the other side of that is I hit the lottery. I'm in remission. But if my cancer comes back, it's work-related. They cover all costs. And if I pass away, it's line of duty death benefits. I got to tell you, when you hit the wall, you know what's most important. And I knew right away it was my family. And sometimes I made my fire family number one. I love my job. I volunteered everywhere I could. <laughs> my priorities mixed up. It didn't take me long to correct that once I got sick. My family's going to be taken care of. And my brothers and sisters are going to make sure that they told me that all along. The union was so strong for Peoria, and I didn't even know about it. You know, a lot of us want to badmouth the union. Man, I want more pay, a better station, better trucks, better... I want everything. It's on the union's shoulder to give this to me. You know, these guys take a lot of abuse from us. And sometimes we're kidding, sometimes we're serious. But when you need them... They're not just representing you. They're representing the state and the international. I told Joe Manning I was going to get sick. I might have to go to Tucson for my care. This IL-2 wasn't readily available in the Valley, only at Mayo. And I didn't know I had Mayo coverage. I would have had to go to Tucson or, Flags or uh, Vegas. I said, it looks like I might have to go to Tucson. And Joe goes, okay, I'll get back to you. He took him a couple hours. He gave me a call back. He goes, I got lodging set up for your wife in Tucson if you need it. He called the Tucson local. They work with an extended state America hotel. Free stay for my wife if I have to go there. We got to tap into those union representatives, man. They can make your day in a really good way. So it's kind of cool. But I'm in remission now. Life is good. I couldn't complain. I've been through the hell and I'm on the other side. And my family goes with me. In cancer, you do not handle on your own. It is a family illness. 
There was no way you can burden it on your own. My wife and I did a deal. She handled the paperwork. I take care of me. All the billing she handled. Won my case. My insurance stopped paying my providers immediately. And then the providers would get notification of lack of payment. And if the service is over a year ago, then he put me straight into collections. And then we'd have to get tell them, no, it's workman's comp now. Here's the contact for the state. Took over two years to straighten up that mess and try to get back to co-pays we paid. But we got it done because my wife was so adamant about keeping track of everything. Uh, I was healthy enough. I was on light duty. I was healthy enough to now get a permanent day position. I became our, our training captain. It's a one-day position we have in the, in the department. So now I'm a training captain, and I tended to train a trainer for cancer prevention uh, with uh, Division Chief Gary West in Northwest Fire District. I took his lecture and ran with it and created something for the West Valley, starting with Peoria. And I've taken off just from doing that. Now that I'm retired, the Firefighter Cancer Support Network asked if I would volunteer for them, and that's what brings me here today. So I, I just covered my short story in a little bit to show where we're at, to validate why I'm part of this process. The FCSN, I'll call it, keep it short, we sponsored the white paper involving 31,000 firefighters from Chicago, Philly, and San Francisco. And the rates of cancer, based on these firefighters that are currently working or retired, our rates of cancer right now is 68% higher than the general public. The general public is 20%. We are three times higher. And what makes these numbers scary is, generally speaking, there's a 10 to 20 latency period, latency period for cancer to develop. The guys that are getting cancer, for the most part, are being accountable for what they did 10 to 20 years ago. I, I look in this room here. Who's my oldest fire? Not, who has most experience? How many years on the job? <laughs> Because you're old. <laughs> see, I, I, I can't, for this, I can't see anybody's faces because of the, the, the light coming from the outside. Because <laughs> you're old. Started in 86. Huh? Started in 86. Okay. So, let me, add, let, tell me if this sounds familiar. The way I was brought up as a firefighter doing overhaul. Captain gives me, we're done with fire suppression. Fire's out, but now we got to start pulling ceiling and stuff. If the air looked clear to the captain, it must be clean. Don't need a pack anymore. Take it off. Start doing overhaul. In those days, you know, we after we started moving, that stuff is bad. It's getting our room, our clean environment's no longer, our clear environment's no longer clean. We're getting pretty dirty. Well, we had these dust masks we would wear, and they're so flimsy we might wear two at a time. Well, then we got this great tool from the EMS world, the N95 mask. They became commonplace for me on the fire ground. So the captain gives me the direction that clear air must be clean, don't need your pack, but now I'm going to have to still pull ceiling, pull out the N95 and wear that. Well, what did I do after the N95 was caked and I couldn't breathe through it, it was going negative? I took it off. Did I put another one on? No, that's at the truck. I'm in here working. As soon as we get done working, as soon as we pick up the hose, as soon as we go back and get another fire. One and done. Did that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Yep. Am, am I asking? Are we asking for cancer? We're demanding it. Because clear air is never clean. The visible, the naked eye could not determine if the air is clear or is clean. I'm sorry. You can say it's clear, but it's not clean. And UL research has proven that in an overhaul environment, the air is always contaminated. Hence, now we've changed our SOPs, SCBA mandatory through the overhaul process. But individual accountability, are you following through with that? In the middle of August, you're hot and tired from this daytime fire, are you following through with that and still wearing your pack? It's individual accountability. It's your life. I can tell you my experience going to the N95 world, and if the stuff was still bad, then I tried breathing through my Nomex hood. I had no filter. No filter to take this in. No filter when we took in. Think of it as smoking. All right, I'm an ex-smoker. It's a good thing I stopped. But do you have to answer for how many cigarettes you smoked? How many fires you did over all the way you did it? We don't know. I'll ask you in 10 to 20 years and see where we're at. Cancer rates are not going down. They're going higher. We are going to see rates increase for the next 20 years. I kid you not. We are going to break 70%. There is no doubt. It's you guys with less than five, well, if you're here, with less than five years on the job that are starting to drop in our rates. 
<clears throat> you guys are changing how we do overhaul, how we do after fire control. It's the younger guys that are going to drop these records down because they're not going to get cancer anymore. So we haven't peaked yet. Based on these guys, respiratory, digestion, urinary tract cancers, we are high for. We are higher for each cancer. Add those cancers up, we're three times higher than the general public, and it's getting worse. There's no way around this. These are the numbers not estimated. It's what we're looking at right now. Uh, a female has a 12% chance of getting breast cancer in her lifetime, one out of eight. San Francisco has the highest percentage of female firefighters. Their cancer rate for females for breast cancer is 88%. It is the exact opposite. Now, you notice that the 12 cancers we added, they're, really, they're, they're a lot male-dependent, testicular, prostate. I was hoping to get breast cancer on that list. To get on that list, we had to have a study group to show we are higher rates for that cancer. And there's not enough female firefighters information to get breast cancer added to our presumptive cancer line. Down the road, we probably can. We're not there yet. So it's sad what we're looking at. Are we good in our turnouts? Any, any of these pictures look familiar. They're all your organization. Are we good in our turnouts? Are you guys safe in the gear you wear? This is where you say, yeah. Has anybody in, in Verde Valley been afraid to go into fire with the turnouts they've been issued? Sure. This ain't a trick question. We love our gear. Hell, we, it, it exceeds federal standards. But here is the limitation of our gear when all we do is add a little bit of dye to the smoke. Just a little fluorescent dye. Tonight on the investigation in into firefighters and cancer. CBS 4 News exclusively obtaining a report that could shed light on concerns over the danger of chemical exposures. Our chief investigator, Michelle Gillen, continues our special report, The Silent Killer. Oh, Staying South Florida sky, Miami-Dade firefighters don traditional personal protective gear to save their lives. But CBS 4 News has exclusively obtained and reviewed a just-concluded study that some veteran firefighters say raises serious questions about the protection that gear offers when it comes to exposure to elements that could be linked to cancer. I feel it basically is confirming our fears on cancer in the fire service. You can see the skin just lights up. This report is eye-opening, says Keith Tyson, Firefighter Cancer Support Network Director for Florida. But when you look at these type of pictures, you start realizing that it's not protecting us 100%. And no, nothing will protect us 100%. But this is frightening. This is really frightening. <laughs> Similar to what this firefighter is donning for us, the test participant was sent into a chamber wearing what's described as clean but used protective gear, but wearing a brand new hood. According to its author, the test was commissioned and paid for by the International Firefighters Association, the Firefighters Union. Basically, they created a smoke, if you want to call it an environment. Uh, what they used was a natural dust that was non-toxic. However, they added a fluorescent dye to it. According to the report, at the conclusion of the test, when the subject removed his gear, traces of the dust made it onto his skin, despite the presumed protective barrier of the hood. But when you can show them a picture, this is what's getting through your gear, and this is the potential issues that you're facing now that makes it a whole different ballgame now. There were also other apparent hot spots on his body where reportedly the elements touch skin, such as his stomach area. Given what's called a billowing effect, an upwind seemed to cross the barrier of the two-piece suit. You've been really concerned about alarming numbers, in your opinion, of thyroid cancer and also what else? Brain cancer. We're starting to see a vast number and brain cancer accounts now for 17% of Miami-Dade Fire Rescue's cancer deaths. That is a horrible number. It appears for those giving deep analysis to this that this hood could end up being the weakest link. That, that's what we need to find out. Broward County's fire chief in charge of health and safety, Todd LaDuke, is taking concerns over the risk of cancer so seriously, his team just sent out three in-service hoods to be tested at the same center, this test paid for by the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. And now we're starting to look and say, 
what chemicals uh, get captured and get trapped in this hood, and then what do we do when that happens? His reaction to the test chamber results? It says to me there's things that we probably can be looking at and doing better. The concern that lingers, he says, the reality that each firefighter has only one set of gear, often having to jump into it time and time again, even in one day, with not enough time to clean it. Many people think, oh, it's just part of the job. You know, we'll die a hero's death and this type of thing. And, you know, dying of cancer is no hero's death. You know, this is, this is a long-term illness that many people suffer through. Across South Florida, there's an emphasis on cleaning that personal protection gear and efforts to get backups. It's a question of money and potentially one of health. A full... I cut her off there because she says a full set of gear costs $20,000. She, she kind of estimated by 10 times more. But this is why cancer is so high for us. Yes. There's an effort on the Verde Valley that I'm actually working with with our rehab group that we are starting to get hoods that we can switch out on fire scenes. But what it boils down to is it's the mentality that it's my hood. I don't want to give it to you. What are we going to do? And we're, it's, it's something that's coming down the pike because it's been on the fire chief's side of it and with our chief that we are providing hoods on our rehab mm -hmm. now where we can switch you a hood if there's extended period of time. But it's just a process of getting people to understand that we have hoods for you, but why am I going to surrender my... I may get a hood that's worse or right. older. Uh, that, was hap that happened in Tempe. You know, what, do you, what do you mean? I got a brand new hood. Let me switch, trade it out. This one that's out of shape and old, that's not going to work. What Glendale did that worked for them is they have a box on their truck, a little, a lot smaller than this, where they put their wipes in, they put after a fire to wipe the, the soot off you. They have a couple sealed packs in there of hoods. You know, one hood per sealed pack, four, four packs on the truck. And each firefighter's issued uh, at least one hood, some have two. Uh, I'm a big fan of having two. You never know if one gets lost. I can tell you as an engineer, I had a lot of people begging for a hood for me on the fire ground. But what they do then, if they have a working fire, they come back, they wash their hood, right? They take that reserve hood on the truck. It's in a, a sealed pack. If they need to open it before their hood's ready, open it up. If they don't, then they, they just put it on their person. If their hood's washed, ready to go back, they put that hood back. So that seems to be working for Glendale. And if you look at a hood exchange program, I think you're looking at the same number of hoods. It's yeah. just each truck is responsible for its own reserve set. And that's working for them. So, yes, you may get a hood worse than yours, but you may not even need it. Actually, yours we have brand new hoods. Yeah. We pay our, our company paid to have at least 30 hoods, brand new. And they're actually sitting in the box in the rehab. They're actually yeah. in plastic wrap that no one's open and I on the last fire I did a rehab for they kind of looked at me like why do you want my hood yeah. like well it's soaked and it's covered in soot and the new yeah. things coming that we should switch your hood and uh, there's still a lot of logistics with uh, how are we going to wash them how are we going to get them back to you and all that but you know if you have first of all you need two a perfect station design has two washer dryers one for your for your clothes and the other for everything else you know, but if you don't have that, and what I did when I was at my station, we only had one set of washer dryer. If I was going to wash my hoods, my gloves, anything like that, I used as one dry the one system I had. But what I did is then I followed it and I ran another load of nothing. Yeah, Bleach, hot water, cycle out. You know where it's going to run as long as it, the longest cycle it can to try to flush out whatever I had in it. It's the best I could work with. You know, I'm not screaming at admin. Give me a second washer. Well, they, they didn't have the plumbing for it. I, I worked my career. I worked with what they gave me and worked around what I could. But that's worked for Glendale. Have your hoods on your truck. You talk about having on a utility truck or a chief's rider or something like that. Well, then you go to your, your, your still assignment, your cars, your dumpsters. Now you got to replace your hood. you got to wake somebody up or bug somebody to come over. But if you have that box of reserve hoods on your truck, you don't bother anybody. You just take care of it yourself. And there has to be individual accountability with this, that it, it can work. So um, this is why cancer rates are higher for us. It's not the lack of the SCBA. That's important. You know, just wearing an SCBA overhaul, we protect our airway 100%. It's the absorption factor that's what's causing cancer for us.
And did you ever think about when you come out of a fire, why we stunk so bad? You know, we had our training academy. We come out, man, we're, first of all, high five, and we just can't believe how much fun we had inside this fire. But why do we stink so bad? And even if you have a fire during your shift, you take a shower at work, you go home, your family members know you had a fire. We're off gassing for how many days? It's the absorption. Our turnouts cannot prevent absorption. They're the best thermal barrier out there. They exceed federal standards. They cannot prevent absorption. Um, I heard a story yesterday of Mesa fire. They went on a, 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 dump, a trash or a garbage truck fire. And if, what's, if a garbage truck is on fire, what do the driver? What's the SOP for the driver to do? Dump, dump the load. Every firefighter, there was two companies on that call, every firefighter that was on that call came down with cancer. Because it came from a hazardous waste site. It wasn't normal trash. Documented, they all have cancer. They got it from the absorption. So they were back in the neighborhoods because of this stuff, because of the smoke and everything. And yet we're right in the middle of it. So it's that absorption factor that we are, are, are not paying attention to. Uh, do we think it's smoke is just as dangerous as the fire? Well, let's put it in perspective here. As Who's my company officers in here? Have you ever had to give the order on the fire ground to mask up? Mm -hmm. You have. Because most of the time, we don't have to be told that. We see smoke, we know mm -hmm. to put a mask on. But if you have to tell your crew, kudos to you to make sure that's covered. So you mask up, right? We're not going to go through a smoke charge bill. We're not going into a smoke charge facility without breathing air. Would you guys agree? Because that's bad smoke. It's bad air. Well, what makes that air okay to breathe at the pump panel? It's the same damn smoke. But we've been brought up that campfires are okay, so if it's outside smoke, it's no big deal. As a company officer, I'm told to do a 360 or something like that, am I wearing my pack when I do that? Because you're in the contaminated area. If I'm at the pump panel, and my engineers know that, it seems for some reason if the smoke is going to bank and layer out, it's going straight for the truck, right? It just makes a beeline right for the truck. It doesn't go away from it in the backyard. It seems to go right for the truck where the engineer's standing. Is the engineer going to wear a pack? I, the engineers I talk to, maybe once or twice an engineer's done it. Majority of the time, they don't. That should be standard operating procedure or not. I'm not saying put on your full turnouts, your helmet, everything else. Just put your pack on. Protect your airway until the smoke clears up. That's the direction we need to go. This to be more preventative. Our physicals. Your physical, is it based on NFPA 1582? The other one is the Wellness Fitness Initiative. The, well, the WFI is the more the, the fit for duty. You ever heard the cardiac, uh, cardiac fit for duty test? It's a more comprehensive cardiac physical. They, they do a CAT scan as your physical is going on. CAT scan of your heart to check out your, your function and everything. It's more in-depth that way. A lot of the valleys doing 1582, they would like to do this heart fit for duty. That being said, what you have to remember about your physicals is it's a physical to determine if you're fit for duty, and that's it. It's not a physical to detect cancer. Some of the tests they do could lead to further testing for a cancer diagnosis, but it's a, a physical are you fit to do your job? That's all they're concerned about. And there's changing that. The FPA is currently working right now of, re of rewriting the current uh, edition we have. We need a physical that's cancer preventative. That's the direction we need to go with this. WFI recommends these things be done minimum, minimum towards cancer detection. And if you look at this list, most of them you have to do with your personal physician on your own. The department physical won't cover it. There's, there's technology out there for early cancer diagnosis. They can, with the urine sample you give, they can do an additional test to rule out bladder cancer. It's specific just for bladder cancer. In Europe, they're training dogs to detect bladder cancer in the urine. And they're higher than a 50% accuracy. WFI says to get that test is $25 extra per person. Somewhere, somehow, there's somebody that decides what type of physical you're going to get or want to have, and they're meeting with some doctor or some health facility, 
how much do they charge to give you that physical? Somewhere there's that meeting of the minds. We need to change. Yeah, it's great to have a physical fit for duty, but let's have one for early cancer detection. ASU, if you saw on TV two nights ago, they developed a blood test, uh, immune, not therapy, but immune something rather, an early blood test that to detect cancer in you that would show up on a cellular level before it could show up on any type of cat screen or anything like that. So that's the stuff. It's still in designing stages here, or testing stages, but that's the stuff we need to add to our physical. We want early cancer detection. Until we get it, get it with your private physician. That's the direction we have to go. Dermatologists, how many people have gone to a dermatologist? That's good, because 20% of us get cancer, and we're not immune to it as firefighters. You know, we think we're better than the public a little, you know, because we're here, but we're not here, we're the, we're the public, we're the same. The same exposures they have, we have. We're not different in that aspect. So we need to just be aware that we have higher rates of cancer and we need to keep it on the radar. That's all I want you to get out of this. I'm not saying be a hypochondriac, but just get the testing done. Remember, my cancer was missed by my health physicals. Scottsdale, Chandler, and Maricopa all have firefighter with kidney cancer, and all of them are okay. The Chandler guy finished his career, retired. Maricopa and Scottsdale um, got theirs treated. They're still on the truck. <clears throat> Surprise had another can kidney cancer. He didn't do so well. He died in two years. The difference between these other three guys, Chandler, Maricopa, and Scottsdale, is they went to their personal physician with a back pain, a, a complaint of back pain. And their personal physician said, well, we better check this out. Let's go get a CAT scan. And it led to their early diagnosis catching their cancer at stage one. Simple surgery, problem gone, monitoring the rest of your life. I didn't do that. I went to a doctor and said, hey, you need to stretch your back. Because they think we're doing healthy firefighters. They shouldn't have any problem. So there's a difference. Get it with your personal physician. So <coughs> by this time, we all know somebody with cancer. Uh, share information if you have it. Be supportive. Help out. Don't leave them out on their own. Let them know they're still part of the organization. And another tool you can offer is the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. If the cancer involves yourself, your spouse, or your kids, contact the Cancer Support Network. We are a national organization. Our state director, there's a director in every state. Our state director is Kane Nixon. He is a captain paramedic in Sun City West, North County Fire Department or Fire District. The uh, assistant state director is Captain uh, Adam Ellis. He's with Glendale Fire. And then I have the other position on the state instructor. We are a 5013C charity. All our monies come from federal grants or donations. <coughs> and if you contact us and say, hey, I got cancer, you email Kane or contact the national on your, on your own. Overnight, we're going to ship you a crate like this. And it's going to have lots of dividers in there and lots of cancer information, hopefully specific to your type of cancer. And it's important with the cancer diagnosis that you keep track of everything, all your x-rays, all your labs, all your doctor's visits. You want to keep track of everything, especially if, if it's going to be you, because then it might be work-related. And if you throw in the dice and say, hey, I've listed on every physical, I've been a smoker, I ended up with lung cancer, that's great. Still save the information because now it, could, it makes you eligible. That information or that evidence could make you eligible to get a, a medical retirement. So it's still important to keep track of all that. Um, another thing the SCSN offers is a mentor. We're going to hook you up with another firefighter that's had the same or similar diagnosis you're facing. And that's important because you get the feeling of cancer diagnosis, you are completely on your own. Nobody else has, has your type of problem. This is something you got to face by yourself. You're the first one ever to have this. That's not the case. And as firefighters, we have a certain mystique about us. All right, we can get along with each other all day long or any other organization. You could sit down and have lunch with a guy from Flagstaff in Tucson, we'd have a ball, right? But what if we put a garbage truck in the mix, a garbage truck driver in the mix, or maybe a police officer? It's not the same. We are connected. We have the same core values. And that's important if you're looking at cancer diagnosis to lean on somebody else who's been through what you're going, what you're facing. We provide that mentorship for you. I'm a mentor in the program. So, and there's no charge. We do that free. We want to give back. As firefighters, we always want to give back. So that's what I think makes the program so invaluable. Brian Moore is the contact for Local 493, which involves the departments of Chandler, Tempe, Phoenix, Glendale, and Peoria. 
over 3,000 members. I contacted the health center that does our physicals for all these guys. Glenda just started doing their own physicals. That they're, they're, uh, they created their own health center at their training academy. But prior to that, Glenda was going through Phoenix. And I contacted Phoenix, creating this class, and said, can you tell me how many people have cancer in the valley here? How bad are numbers we looking? I told you how bad it was in, in Boston or Miami-Dade. I even told you Frisco. And Phoenix Fire couldn't answer me. They don't know. They're not tracking it. This latest, greatest health center that's for firefighters that they show these national surveys everything, they couldn't tell many firefighters have cancer. But, you know, Phoenix Fire does give you a chest x-ray every five years. Are they doing that to rule out lung cancer? TB, right? TB. And I was up at Lake Havasu. They get a chest x-ray every year. So, man, stop that process. You end up with cancer from radiation. TB is on their radar. What's on their radar is what you can give somebody else, not what you absorb. Phoenix is not tracking cancer for their firefighters. But Brian Moore is able to give me information. From 2008 to 2012, Phoenix Fire had 36 cases of cancer. I don't know if they're active or retired. I just know it was 36. Fast forward now, how many times is Brian Moore being contacted from those five cities I've recommended or, or, or talked about that now they're dealing with cancer? What Phoenix Fire handled in a five-year period are now getting in one year. That's how bad we are in the valley. What took 36 cases over five years to get, we are getting that almost every year now. The cancer rates are going substantially higher. And we're paying the price what we did 10 to 15, 20 years ago. The rates are going to keep going higher. We've got another two decades to deal with this. So our mission to provide comfort, strength, hope, educate, promote awareness that you're not on this battle alone. There's other people who have been through it. And there's lessons that we've learned, and we can hopefully show, share those with you so you can avoid it. It's a great organization. I believe in it 100%. So together we make a difference. We really can. Do we ever think of a house fire as a hazmat call? A dumpster fire, a car fire, any still assignment do we think of as a hazmat call? The structure fire. No, but it should be. Yeah. Every one of them should be. You guys have one set of gear, and you're going to wear it for every fire, right? With no questions asked, no fear, we're going in. But what we've got to remember is the carcinogens that's on our gear. I hate to pick on you. You have an extractor out there. Why do you wash your gear after a fire? It's it up. Okay, that's the perfect answer. But a lot of people say it's dirty. But I wash my gear because it's dirty. No, that's a bad definition. We are washing our gear after a fire because it's contaminated. We are maintaining our hood, helmet, and gloves because it's contaminated. It's not dirty. It's contaminated. It's covered in these carcinogens. If you want to look at trying to get your fire district to approve getting you two sets of gear or getting the, the approval that you can now apply for a federal grant to get two sets of gear, any direction you want to go with that, you have to establish the, the vocabulary that we're doing this because our gear is contaminated after a fire. That's the first thing you have to convince everybody. It's contaminated. That's why we need replacements. And if we can't get a second set, it just verifies how well we have to take care of our first set. Because it's contaminated after every every incident. That's the mentality we have to go. That's the vocabulary we have to use. If you see this list, that's a small amount what's on our gear. What you see in red is most important because that's what's over everything. Soot is that bad thing we take with us. It's a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. It's cancerous. Soot is what's all over our gear, all over our tools, all over our equipment our hose, our nozzles, inside our truck, it's everywhere. Soot is the thing we have to deal with. And are we dealing with it? The problem with our profession is we love fire. We cannot be effective firefighters without loving fire. Just admit it, we're all pyros. That's fine. That's what makes us succeed in our job. But we've extended what we love to fire to the byproducts of fire. If you come to work in the morning, the shift before I had a fire, and you open up the cab door, what do we all do? Is it inhaling it, or are we smelling it? Man, you smell a fart. We're inhaling this stuff. We like it. This is a good odor. 
right? Some of us, it's a badge of honor to keep dirty or contaminated gear on. You know, if the helmet started off yellow and now it's black, it's I don't care, it shows I'm a good firefighter, look how dirty it is. It means nothing. As a company officer, do you evaluate the expertise or the experience of your crew based on their appearance? Hell no. They usually on their seniority or their mentality. It's everything but their appearance. Dirty or contaminated gear means nothing. We think it's a perceived level experience, and it's not. It just means you're dirty. You need better hygiene. Contaminated equipment needs to be taken care of. Individual accountability. So let's look at how stuff enters our body. You know what? You guys want to take a quick 10-minute break? We'll start here. Can you guys on the other screen hear me? Wave. If you're awake, yay! <laughs> 10 minutes. You guys are food and snack. If we want to reduce cancer, we got to know how it occurs, right? i to give you examples of how we get exposed to it. Inhalation is preventative 100% if the SCBA starts to finish. Do we need that light off or is it okay with it on? You still have the glare? No, we're good. All right. SCBA start to finish, now we take care of inhalation 100%. All right, do we have that SOP in place? I thought we did for Fergie Valley. SCBA during overhaul? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Do it. So inhalation's off the board, right? Other than an SCBA in the cab when we inhale that. But relatively speaking, it's off the board. Ingestion, is this an issue? How can we pre prevent ingesting these carcinogens? Wash your hands. Yeah. We want to impress and it, it, stop ingestion, we wash our hands. But let's go one step further. And this gives me, I don't know how your department is, do you guys have a rig day? Dedicated day to take care of the truck. What day is that? Mondays. Mondays. Okay, engineer. Mondays rig days. Anything's wrong, we've got five days from the tanks to fix it. Great day, right? Engineer works a little harder that day. Well, when's the last time you deconned your cab or washed your cab floor? <laughs> You know what? A week ago? The common answer is never. But you, your crew did it a week ago. So that's good. You did, you did it. You guys go grocery shopping and eat together? Where do the groceries go? Right on the floor. Cab floor? And then we bring it right into the station on the kitchen counter and tables? Mm -hmm. You guys are no different than anybody else. I haven't even had dinner with you, and I know. We don't wash the kitchen counter or table till we're done eating. We bring these groceries right from the truck, put them right on where we eat or where we prep food, and don't even think twice about it. We're ingesting it every day. How many of us ate in the cab? All of us. You can't tell me you haven't had a snack or something inside the cab of the truck. Dairy Queen Run, breakfast burrito, whatever it is, you've ate in the cab. And we admit that maybe we wash the cab once, maybe even once a week. It's still not enough. Mm -hmm. It's the worst, our cab is the worst environment we're in. It's everything from the EMS world, it's everything from the fire world, and it's in one spot. And by our own admission, we may or may not wash it. It's the dirtiest environment we're in. But we think we're in so often, it's our safe zone. It never has been. Ingestion, yeah, we can prevent it. We just have to be aware of what we're doing. So don't put groceries in the cab if you're not gonna clean it. So injection. The only way I can see this happening is a building collapse, a, a, you know, some, a roof collapse or something like that, which smart firefighting, that's off the board. We don't have to worry about that. But absorption. We saw the video that for us is die on us. Absorption we cannot prevent. But there's things we can do about it. So first of all, let's look at how bad absorption factors are. This is a normal temperature, normal body temperature person in a normal room and temperature environment. If you add a firefighting environment to this, multiply it by 100 times more. But look how bad, a, our hands are a six. The least res resorbent part of our body is good because look how dirty it gets after a fire. You wore your structural fire gloves for firefighting. You wore your work gloves to load hose after the fire. You get back to the station and you still have soot on your hands. And how many washes does it take to get it off your hands? Now we're start using industrial soap. We'll get the goop out, scrub sponges, everything else to start cleaning our hands from this stuff. It's the absorption from it. 
And it's such a low number because look how dirty they get. So that's good. But let's look down. Forehead, 43. Now we're starting to get higher areas. Miami-Dade, 17% of their fatal cancers are brain. Did they get that from inhaling it? Maybe, more than likely, the absorption. Down from there is our jaw, 93. What's down from there? Just in our neck is our thyroid. Thyroid is very high for firefighters. I was hoping that thyroid would have been in one of the new cancers we added. It's not. There's not enough evidence there for it. What are we doing with our Nomex hoods after a fire? Are they staying around your neck? Something to think about. So, and now let's look at the worst part of our, well, I would say the best part of our body. It's up to you to make that determination. Most absorbent part of our body is our groin. And I always said scrotum here, but for women, it's, the, it's groin. Our most absorbent part of the body. And where's the first part of our turnouts that's going to wear out? Is the crotch. Generally speaking, your turnouts have a 10-year lifespan. If you have a worn out crotch and you're keeping your gear because you think it's comfortable, you're doing yourself a disservice. All you're doing is increasing your absorption rate there and your exposure. We all know prostate cancer is very relevant or prevalent in males, but it's in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. But in the fire service, we have males getting prostate cancer in their 30s and their 40s. There's a problem there. And if you have worn out crotch for your gear, if any of us saw that on an outer liner of your jacket, we'd call each other out on it all day long. Your jacket's ripped. You've got to fix it. But for some reason, if it's in your crotch, it's your own problem. Do you have a turnout inspection program? You know, God forbid if you get hurt in a fire, the first thing they're going to red tag and take is your gear. And if your gear is, if, is determined that it was broken down over use, it's torn, ripped, and worn out, and that caused you to get burned, there's some accountability on your end. How's that going to work with your coverage? I don't know. I don't know how that all works out. I'm just saying, why have that opportunity even come up? It's your responsibility if your gear is not in working order to get it red tagged to get repair or replaced. Personal accountability. And if you have a turnout inspection program, that's great. What we did in Peoria, we have target solutions. There's training program on target solutions to inspect gear. It doesn't matter who the manufacturer is. We do it accordingly with our minimum company standards training. The captain's responsible for that. So, and we may get a uh, negative based system. You only had to file paperwork if there was a problem. So we're not getting quarterly. Everybody's gear is good. It's supposed to be good. Let us know if it's bad. You have to let us know if it's good. So, and let's go a step further with this. We know what we <coughs> absorb, we off gas. Our family members smell it later. Right? Mm -hmm. If you have absorbed a lot, your gear is not in working order, your groin has absorbed a huge hit of this, absorbed a huge hit of carcinogens from your fire. How many of us are sexually active? There's no studies, there's no way to even begin a study to see if it's possible of us giving carcinogens to our significant other. But if we are going to get rid of it by sweating out, can they absorb it? Absolutely. So that's the double-edged sword on this. And I can tell you in Peoria, we've had more spouses being tested positive for cancer than firefighters. Is there a connection? I don't know. So if we're on the fire ground, do these two guys, if they never go inside, do these guys need to fill out an exposure? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. If you're on the fire ground, if all you did was stage down the road at the hydrant, and now you're going to come up and help them load hose, you have an exposure. You need to track the exposure. And you guys have one in place. You're using Target solutions. Most of the values using Target. I absolutely love Target. Target is nothing but data retention. It's, it's just data storage. The bonus to Target is it has training modules in it. That's the bonus of the program. We have formulated everything in Target. We do our truck checks in there. We do our drug checkoffs in there. And I created an exposure report we put in there. And the rest of the value use that as a template to start building their own. The best exposure report I've seen is with Glendale Fire, and they'll share that. If you want to call the contact for Target Solutions, say, hey, can you download it, what Glendale's using? They'll, she'll do that for you. It's important we track exposures because, you know, it's not a feather in the chief's cap. The fire district board is not happy the chief is providing the, the software for you to document exposures. It is a service that is 100% for you because if anybody needs it, it'll probably be you. And are the exposures going in for every 
incident or event that occurs. What you get is what you get out. And it's life or death because a surprise mm -hmm. firefighter diagnosed four weeks before me passed away his kidney cancer in two years. He couldn't fight it. Every fork in the road for his cancer, he went the opposite of me. I am still here because I was able with my 2,000 exposures to prove it was workman's comp. The exposures did it. It's overwhelming documentation. That's what's going to save you. That's what your protection is, is documenting the exposures. So I made our form very generic because I had some guys, I don't know about you, but it seems the cities love to rent out a corner of the fire department lot, fire station lot, for cell phone, cell phone towers. There is some early information out there that that can lead to cancer, the exposure to cell phone tower waves. There's some people pushing for that. I was contacted for someone that lives up, and, believe it or not, that lives in this area. They want me to look more information up on that. So our, our guys, the exposure report's not tied to an incident. You know, let's say you have an exhaust removal system and it's broken. You can put exposure to diesel exhaust. So, and we all have exposures for the EMS world, right? But they're generally because you have direct uh, fluid contact, right? Or a needle stick. But how many times, CB, or, or TB, some infectious disease. But wouldn't it be nice to, to document the difficulty of breathing calls we go on where we can smell the cigarette smoke in the front door, in the front yard. Yeah. Well, you can document this now. Hey, expose the secondhand cigarette smoke for 20 minutes inside their house. Put it on the form. You never know if you need it. We know secondhand smoke causes cancer. <laughs> Put it in there. There's no reason you can't. You don't need a medical backup with this that it's the TB exposure or hepatitis exposure or anything else. I'm just documenting the event. I was exposed to secondhand smoke. You can do that with target. So it's not just tied to our fire environment. Because what you do during your career adds up. The calls you go on add up. If you're an engineer and you never wore a pack and you breathe smoke and every single call, maybe it's five breaths. Well, if you have 400 career fires, that's 2,000 breaths. It's going to make a difference. They, there's a cumulative effect here. So be aware of that. We're here for the long haul. Now, if we're wearing our turnouts, you guys call them bunker gear or turnouts? Both. Both. You know how bunker gear came into terminology? It's our turnouts. At night, you put them next to your bed. Night, they're bunker gear. Oh. You know, look at Emergency. Remember that show? Yep. They would fight fire in their FRs during the day, and night, they wear their bunker gears because they put them next to the bunks. So that became bunker gear. They're there to fight fire, and that's all they're there for. We know after a fire, they are contaminated. With that in mind, we have no right to wear them in these <coughs> private businesses. Where our turnouts coming back from a call and stopping at Circle K for a big gulp is wrong. We are contaminated. We have to respect the general so public. So we're in your bunker gear, and you're wearing shorts in the summertime, or you're working out, and then you have an EMS call. Instead of wearing your... Station gear, you put your bunkers in, and now you're traipsing around at someone's house. Is it appropriate also? It's, it, it is completely <laughs> irresponsible. Uh, the next step further is how can you justify to me wearing your turnouts on an EMS call in somebody's home? I don't. You can't. You can't. Now, if you have a policy that you wash your, you know, you have the extractor here at the station, you're washing your turnouts after every incident, and you have clean turnout gear, Started that shift, I, you know, I, I can't argue. I guess you could wear that in an EMS call. But generally speaking, you should. We have a uniform we're supposed to wear, right? If you're PTN, it's a different deal. With that in mind, if you catch a fire from your station, you take your shoes with you and change on scene because you shouldn't have dirty turn or contaminated turnouts in the cab. There's a very small window that you should wear turnouts on an EMS call. A medical illness, you know, it's called. There's a very small window to wear your gear. That's what we need to respect out of this. So diesel exhaust, is that an issue for you guys? Yes. I look at your station here. You have no exhaust removal system. Is that important? Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> All right, and it's my opinion, no, and here's why. Look what EPA has done to the standards. EPA has increased emissions to such a level, it's not as bad as we thought it was. We remember coming first on the job, open cabs. 
you hit the gas, and there's this black cloud of diesel exhaust coming out. Those days are gone. We're getting newer trucks. I heard your oldest truck was a, is a 95? 99. 99. So you can see what ballpark that's in. Yeah, it's still up in this area here. But that being said, if you have a limited budget, diesel exhaust systems are expensive. They are. If you have a limited budget, you're better off to go after maintenance of a, your turnouts or a second set than you are exhaust systems because I can get around it. If we're specking new trucks, I can spec them with vertical exhaust. That's a big one. We did that in Peoria. The cost of going vertical, $200. When you're buying a half a million dollar truck, what's 200 bucks? We have vertical exhaust. What else we can do, and what we did in Peoria and Glendale did this too, is when we spec our bay, Instead of, having, instead of having a direct exhaust removal system, we spec the bay with bigger swamp coolers. And we put 30 inch, in Peoria, we put 30 inch exhaust fans in the wall at each end of the station, the north and south end. We're blowing it in and we're pushing it out. We are refreshing the bays. And that works as far as OSHA is concerned. That passed everything. I noticed you have swamp coolers in your bay here, but they're only going to be working during the summer. Well, have them work during the winter, just shut the water off to it. And that could be your exhaust removal system. Pick a positive pressure in there to help blow that stuff out of the bay. What about just opening both doors when you're running in and out? That, that works too. That, what I'm saying is ways around diesel exhaust. Truck checks in the morning you can do on the back or front apron. Don't do it in the station or inside the bay. There's ways we can get around diesel exhaust. And plus with the increased standards, it's not that big bad animal it used to be. Yeah, it's still something that has to be respected. But you're still looking at a cumulative effect. And the bottom line with that is, is in our station right here, we have our turnouts hanging outside in the base. So even if the wind is blowing wrong and you're outside doing your truck checks, the diesel exhaust is blowing into the base. And at station 32, you have a, um, a turnout room. And what I did when I worked out at 32 is I would leave the vet fan on all the time and close the door to the bunk room. Well, other people would just open the door up. Well, the exhaust for the ambulance that happens to be sitting right there once you start up, it blows all that exhaust right into the bunker room. The diesel or the exhaust is an issue. It is. It is for you based on the scenario. And you know, I forgot, most departments now have a turnout room. Uh, you still have yours in the bay here. Uh, but you have a turnout cleaning program, so that kind of offsets it. But that being said, ultimately, if the department has spare money, you know, shedding back or whatever is, is better than what having them on a the wall here. But I haven't seen a lot of diesel stains or soot stains in your, exhaust stains in your bay or anything. So I, I think the problem's under control. But you're the best judge of that. I'm just here for that five minute tour out there. So if you have money and go after exhaust system, do it. Most departments are ca uh, cash strapped. And with that the case, I said go for the turnouts first. So, but EPA has increased our standards. We're much better now. Now, are, you guys have a newer truck with the DEF. We have not done any long-term studies on DEF yet. Yes, it burns cleaner than diesel's used to, but we don't know if there's long-term effects from that. So there's studies in place for that. So we don't know yet. Uh, different chiefs around the valley. They have stepped up. I shouldn't say stepped up. It's part of their job. They are leaders. And with that leadership, they are accepting the challenges of being cancer preventative in the fire service today. And that's, that's a tough sell because as a company officer, one of the hardest things you face is the culture. If all of a sudden the culture says we're in mandatory SCBAs during overhaul, you get pushback at first, especially during the summer. Man, I'm hot and I'm tired. Why the heck are you making me wear a pack? To change the culture is one of the hardest things facing leadership, facing them. And they're hitting, that, they're hitting it head on. Your chief has allowed me to come out here and give this class. He knows there's going to be people knocking on his door saying we, we need to change or do this or do that. And you got to understand, he's doing everything he can with the budget he's given. It's just different terminology to the fire board that our gear's contaminated that we need to get start going towards other funding. So I'll skip this video for time, but it's just the president of the SCSN talking about the same thing I'm doing. He mentions in here, I give a brief five-minute window of his 12-hour class. Now I have you here for two hours. You want me to knock the class down to one minute? Because I can't. Now that you have this much information, background, you know, in the mid-80s, we started this job, we did not wear gloves. We did not wear gloves on a call. 
It was cool if you had somebody's blood all over your hands. You're on a trauma, you get blood up to your elbows, it was cool. And you literally would go to the pump panel, and with tank water, no soap, you'd rinse the blood off. Go back to the station, I'll wash it later. What freaked us out in the fire environment that all of a sudden we had to start wearing gloves? HIV. Boy, that freaked us out big time. HIV. <clears throat> and then we started wearing masks because now we're still at all this other stuff we can get airborne. TB. Now, let's fast forward two decades. Do you guys even go? Uh, do you have minor calls? What do they call AOI? What do you call your, a code 2 call? Citizen assist. Citizen assist. <laughs> we call it AOI, available on incident. So you go on that call, help somebody off the floor, not injured. Is anybody going into that resident without wearing gloves? Even if it's your relative, if you're going on his mom, are you all still wearing gloves? Yeah. We, have, we are so freaked out. As a company officer, if you're on a bad medical call and you or your crew has somebody else's fluids all over them, are you unavailable to decon? If you're covering somebody else's crap, are you unavailable? Yeah. Absolutely. Covering somebody else's blood, you're unavailable? Absolutely to decon. But when you're coming back from a fire, are you available? It won't start. Yeah. It's just to say you're still contaminated. If we respect soot like we respect blood, there's no problem. Problem's gone. We won't tolerate somebody else's blood a drop in our arm. How fast can we get an alcohol prep to wipe that off? I mean, that's number one. Yeah, I don't care if this guy's head's almost off. i got a drop of blood on me. <laughs> Some of us are that bad. If we respect soot the same way we do blood, the problem's gone. It's that simple. That's how you knock it down. And we can get that way. It doesn't change how we fight fire, how effective we are because we love fire. We just have to respect the byproducts of fire, and the problem's gone. The role of the company officer. This came out of FDIC 2013. They had a cancer symposium class there. And the role of the company officer, who is the most important position on the department, the chief, the board, the chief can make all the decisions they want in the world and write all the SOPs they want. It's up to the company officer to follow and enforce them. They're going to decide which ones they embrace, which ones they don't. The success of an organization is on the shoulders of the company officer, without a doubt. If you want to have a successful organization, look at the company officer. They're the ones that meet the public. That's going to make or break your image. And you guys have a very good image. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. I haven't heard a bad story about Verde Valley. Have you? No, we kicked butt. But as a company officer, you got to change your game a little bit. You have to establish clear ex expectations of cancer awareness, documenting exposures, and prevention of cancer and other carcinogens. As a company officer, do you guys have a lot of, uh, of growth here? Are you building a lot of stations, adding a lot of equipment? So the idea of a crew being working together for five, ten years is highly possible. As a company officer, you are responsible for your crew's career. It's that simple. You are. And I, I can tell you, as my years as an engineer, what allowed me to drive and follow traffic signals when I can see the smoke column, which is the hardest thing as an engineer to drive to. You don't want to look at the smoke column. you got to look at the traffic. My motivation to follow the traffic laws, to stop at the four ways, to stop at the red lights, was I did not want to have to answer to one of the spouses in back. That was my motivation to do my job. And I would extend it as a company officer. My motivation to, to do this is I don't want to have to answer to a spouse of one of my guys getting cancer. Do I have a role to play in that? I can't happen what happened. I can't change what happened 5, 10, 15 years ago. I can't change what's happening forward. Because our guys with three years on, five years on, should not get the cancer exposures the rest of us have. So the company officer has a role in this. And it doesn't stop there. Our battalion chiefs have to step up too. Uh, I don't know about your battalion chiefs here, but I've been experienced a lot in the valley there, and I can't tell you how many times if I was first on scene of an incident, that once we had fire control, the company, the battalion chief would come up to me and say, you got this. Call me if you need me. Go AOR when you're done. They checked out. They were done. They were there to manage the incident and manage a ride or prevent a ride to the hospital in an ambulance. 
And they thought once the scene stabilized, fire control, they're no longer needed. Well, they blew off the part that's going to put you in hospice. Because I haven't told you anything about fire attack. I've not said one thing how you attack fire. You guys know that. Everything I'm talking about is after fire control. And that's what puts us in hospice. And it's up to the company officer and our battalion chief. Our battalion chief is responsible. He's responsible for writing your evaluation, right? How can he write an effective evaluation of your leadership skills with your crew if they only show up on the multiple unit responses they're dispatched with you? How many, what percentage of your calls is that? Three? Five? See, the other 90% of the calls you do, they're not even there to evaluate you. How can you write an effective evaluation? Is it based on hearsay or rumors? <clears throat> they have to step up their game and be a part of the crew more active and be a, a resource to that captain as they're trying to enforce these changes with cancer prevention. So what do we do? Doom and gloom. I heard a guy at the break say, man, I'm going to be a cop. We don't have to do that. <laughs> okay? We do not have to be cops. It's simple. These changes can help reduce our cancer rates. And I can tell you, it's my personal opinion, if we do these things, we already know we're healthier than the general public. Studies show that without a doubt. We're healthier than the general public. Even though our cancer risks are higher, if we do these preventions, we can actually make it lower, and we can have a lower cancer rate than the public, but we won't know for 30 years. We can do this. There is no doubt we can do this. SCBA start to finish during overall. Yes, we have an SOP in place, but are you adhering to it? It's individual accountability. So wet nap, baby wipes, to remove as much soot as you can from your head, neck, face, and arms. We guys have that. And you're using one of the best ones out there, the fire wipes. Uh, it's great. I heard you got those for free. They are expensive, that particular brand. There are other ones out there that are a little bit cheaper. As long as you got these free and you use them, knock yourself out. When you, get, when you have to get new ones, shop around and get what's best for your organization. Uh, next up, shower after a fire. Stay unavailable. Decon after a fire. We have to do something about the absorption. What do we do? Limit our time in the structure. What's the old adage in the fire service? First in? Last out. Last, last out. In. Are we asking for cancer in our line of work? <laughs> the stupid policies and procedures we have in place, based on pride. We embrace the team concept. That's what makes us so successful. We work as a team. Nobody works individually. We work as a team. And those teams are crews, right? So if you're first, disp you're first on scene of a fire, it's not your fire. I'll give you ownership if you started it. <clears throat> but you're there to put it out. You're just part of the team. You're the team that's there first. You're going to have to special call a company to handle overhaul. Your crew's had their hit. You've had your absorption. Special call another company. We already do it in the summer if it's too hot. Do that year round. That last company coming in is there for overhaul. You've had your crew's had their exposure. When it's 15, 30 minutes, you're done. We have to do something with absorption. We can't to minimize it. You minimize your time in the structure. You've had your hit. Now, somebody would argue, what's, isn't it better to have one crew get an hour and a half absorption rather than every crew get 15? No, it's far better all of us get less. Spread it out. In the grand scheme of your career, you're going to be doing just as much overhaul as you do in the old style. First in, first out. So we limit our time in the structure. We come out. We wipe it off as fast as we can. And we're unavailable to shower it off as fast as we can. Mandatory showers after a fire, engineer included. No brain. And I have documentation here. I wrote an SOP that we take showers as partners. Partners? Yes, wash each other's back in groin. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Got their attention, didn't you? Yeah. How come you turned around? <laughs> hey. Why'd you get so excited? <laughs> there's always there's always one that gets happy about this. Really? He just wants a job. <laughs> <laughs> He's already got the speedos. He'll do anything for real. <laughs> so mandatory shower after fire. My fingerprint ID card is current. <laughs> you know, and from a, a, a battalion chief or a chief's gonna look at, oh my god, I'm gonna have my whole department out available at the same time. Tell me the last time everybody left the fire at the same time. We stair step coming in, it'll be the same thing going out, even at bigger gas. And how long does it take to take a shower? Five minutes? Unavailable, decom when you get back to the station. We spend more time with the truck than we do with our, our own bodies. So decon after a fire. 
Clean your PPE, gloves, hood, and helmet after a fire. It's contaminated. Dirty gear is not a sign of experience. It's just that you're dirty. Accountability, clean your own stuff. Do not take contaminated gear home. Or if, you have, if you're a rover and you have a car, if you've got to put it in your trunk, does your department issue gear bags? Turn out gear bags. Put it in the bag. If nothing else, maybe if it's dirty or contaminated, put it in a plastic bag. And then leave it the minimum amount of trunk, time in your trunk it needs to. Don't leave it in there. Because if you have a car, more than likely you have kids. And there's no vapor barrier between that back seat and the trunk. If you're going to use it to haul it because you have no other vehicle, fine. you got to do what you got to do. But get it out of the trunk as soon as it meets your destination. Do not leave it there. I had one firefighter say that his wife gets mad if it's on the back patio or something. And we know some relationships, the wives are in charge. Actually, most of them they are. <laughs> so... I told him, tough. This is one time you, dare, you know, put your leg, stomp your foot down, or whatever it takes. No. It stayed right here. I'm not leaving it in the car. If it smells, all the more reason. And explain why. I'm sure she'll understand it. It's a lot healthier kids. So, decon the truck after a call. We already admit, maybe we clean the truck once a week. Maybe we don't clean it maybe once a year. Decon the truck after your fire. The cab should be our clean zone. We already said we're not going to put contaminated turnouts in the cab, right? Even though we have an SCBA in there. It should be our clean zone. You should be starting back in your trucks, putting the, cab, the SCBA back into compartments. Do you guys get tested on how fast you put a pack on? Yes. You got tested in the academy. Do you still get tested out in the field? Yep. You don't get tested anymore in SCBA times? Yeah, MCS. Yeah. MCS. MCS. So that time does not mean from sitting in the seat with a pack on. It's outside a compartment on the floor, right? Failing. So that's where we originally had them. They need to go back there. Uh, we have already have a policy. Bunker gear does not stay in the stations, right? As a company officer, you like a clean house. Nobody brings their turnouts into the house, right? And I'm sure you have a policy that you don't wear them into, well, into your admin here or city hall. Would you wear turnouts in those facilities? Absolutely not. So it's our clean house. Wear the turnouts where you need them, and that's it. Healthy diet and a workout after a fire. Now, you're a company officer here, and you had a working fire, and health, and it shows, and I'm here saying you need to have a healthy workout. A healthy diet, we're already doing, cardiac smart. But now I've got to have my crew sweat out what they got in. We limit our time in the structure for the absorption. We washed off, wiped off what we could, went back, washed off what we could, but we still have to sweat out what got in. So, what's the best way to have your crew sweat it out? Steam room and sauna. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> sauna. Absolutely correct. The sauna is the best way to go. Because as a company officer, you have to have your crew ready for that next call. Are you going to want them to go out in the middle of the summer to jog till they sweat, knowing they have to be ready for another call? Or to rather them sit with a big glass of water on their butt in a sauna sweating it out? Sauna is the only way to go. If you look at the expense of a sauna, first of all, it can all be plugged into 110, so any firehouse power, uh, patio can support it, and it costs about two grand per station. Scott sales put their station. You look up north, uh, of, I know St. Paul, Minneapolis area, they have testimonials how well these saunas are working for their firefighters. Yeah, but then how much stuff seeps into the wood in those things? You sit on a towel uh, and have your towel absorb everything. Otherwise, you're going to have to decon the sauna. There's, that's why you can't. Some people say, "Why not a jacuzzi? Nice hot jacuzzi. I'll sweat out in the water." Then you gotta have to change jacuzzi water. So sauna is the way to go. So stop using tobacco. Start using sunscreen. Gross decon on scene. You guys do that? Yeah, you got one set of gear. I got to maintain it. It's supposed to protect me. It needs a little care. So it's good we have that in place. Weakest link in our gear. Hood. Absolutely the hood. So we have a hood exchange program. You guys have one, you're just trying to make it a better uh, work more easily. That's great. That being said, you should never ever have a, do you guys ever critique after a fire? AARs. Station, do you have a station critique or a um, scene critique after a fire? Yeah. Major after car wreck? Review. What? AARs, after actual reviews, yes. Okay. So, if you have that going on, you should never ever see a scene like this. The hood has no business hanging around our neck after a fire. All it's doing is increasing the absorption rate because we're nice, hot, and sweaty. And right where that hood goes is our thyroid. 
If you're done with the flyer and you're not using your mask, take your hood off. <coughs> Outside of Wildland, you cannot tell me a flyer where you need the hood and not the mask. They go together. Mask off, hood off. It serves no purpose other than increase absorption to a certain area of the body. We do these things that are recommended. We're going to miss the cancer truck. That's our goal. Is anybody working for 20 to 32 years and then dying? Is that your goal? No. Absolutely not. But let me put this in perspective for you. The life expectancy nationally for a firefighter today is 57. How many of us looking at retiring later, older than that? That's the life expectancy for us right now, 57. You're over 57, you beat it. These aren't made up numbers. These are people that already died and established this. How many are dying before 57 to drop it to that low? So the number one cause of line of duty deaths, 50, almost 55% is cancer. How much training do you get to prevent an injury or fatality on the fire ground? And how much training have you had for cancer prevention? Cancer is the number one line of duty death, and it's only getting higher. We're at 54.8% right now. And these are guys that are able to, to connect cancer to the job. The majority of us can't. We're dying with our boots off, and there's no fanfare. You said cancer is the number one cause of line of duty death. Is that while the person is still working, or does that include people that are retired and still get it linked to their job? It's people that have it linked to their job. Okay. Whether they're active or retired, I can't tell you. They're ones that had it linked to their job, okay. which is hard to do. So only 34 states have a cancer presumptive law. So those other 34 states that don't, there's no way cancer is connected to the job. So the number should be a lot higher. So the average length of stay for a firefighter diagnosed with cancer is 35 to six, 30 to 45 days. Length of hospitalization for a firefighter with cancer. That's the average. So these are not very good numbers. Why is cancer so bad for us? What has changed over the last 30 years that wasn't there 40, 50 years ago? And it's right here what you're sitting on and laying down on. In 1975, California passed a bill to add flame retardant chemical to the furniture industry. It's added to the fabric, it's added to the foam insulation. And they based it, they used faulty data from NASA, who's very concerned about fire in space. There's no exit for those guys in a space capsule. <laughs> they skewed the data 100% and said, you gotta have this. And it's such a huge lobby effort behind the chemical industry that the fire service in California couldn't fight it. They couldn't keep up with it. And so the California legislature passed it in 75 that all furniture should not be sold in California has to be treated with flame retardant chemicals. California is such a huge retail market, it has to go national. The chemical mm -hmm. industry didn't say we have to hit every state. It said all we got to need is California. California is so liberal, we can get this through. And they did. And we eat it. And we knew in the fire service it's leading to cancer. It's our number one cause of death. Because when it burns, it off-gasses. Well, I'll get to the next slide here. In 2014, California finally listened to the fire service, and they didn't outlaw it. They just said you could buy furniture not treated with it. So you go to your home, you go to your furniture stores now, the majority of it will still have the <clears throat> tag underneath it that it was treated. I looked at your office furniture in here. If it's like that chair there, it's treated. These plastic chairs are not. Fabric on it are. Well, what we found out in the fire service is that when it burns, it off gases dioxin and furin, two heavy carcinogens that lead to cancer. Experts, feel, some experts feel this is our number one cause of cancer in the fire service. It's furniture. It's in our dumpsters. It's in our cars. That's why our cancer rates are higher. But what helped us out in this great battle is HBO did a documentary on. It's called Toxic Hot Seat. It's no longer on HBO, but it's on YouTube. If you're bored, I recommend watching it. Toxic Hot Seat. And we were just one part of this documentary. It's an hour long. We were just one part of it in the fire service. What helped us out now is studies are showing that this stuff, when it breaks down, 
is off-gassing as well. And the first place it showed up in was breast milk. You want to look at kids, younger kids, or kids are getting diagnosed with cancer? Think about a kid running around. Where's their face when they're running around on the furniture? furniture. Sleeping on the beds, the mattresses and everything. You're going out to buy new furniture. I highly, I strongly recommend you buy furniture not treated with flame retardant chemical. And it's so commonplace, Joanne's Fabrics. I want to go buy a UV protectant for my patio furniture. I could buy this in a 32 ounce spray bottle. It's not outlawed, but it leads to cancer. So this is a short trailer for the documentary. Uh, the firefighters they interview are from San Francisco. The San Francisco firefighter captain says he has transitional, transitional cell carcinoma. That's the other form of kidney cancer. Uh, the, the one I have is clear cell. Everyone has a fear of fire, right? No one wants to burn up in a fire. The temperature rises and rises until suddenly everything is burning. We have developed a method for applying a flame retardant in the home. Every American home has flame retardants in their couch. These are chemicals measured by pounds and ounces. Flame retardants accumulate in people and wildlife in places around the world. And they're toxic. And building up in breast milk and being passed on to the next generation. We are in the middle of a giant, uncontrolled experiment on American children. Why do we have these chemicals in our lives? Why do we have them in our furniture? Why do we have them in our bodies? Flame retardants are important to save lives. We already have the highest fire safety standard. The study is so obscure, we had it translated from English. The industry doesn't have a copy. You can't find it online. We had to go to the National Library of Sweden to get a copy. If the science shows these chemicals don't really even work, why are we getting the potential risk and none of the benefit? These fires now are it's an absolute toxic soup. I had transitional cell carcinoma, a rare form of cancer found in people in the chemical industry. I've had co-workers die in fires, and I've had a lot more die of cancer. I had all these chemicals in my body, including flame retardants. Folks said, we need a legislator willing to take on a fight against the chemical industry. And I was like, let's go for it. Health advocates and the chemical industry are facing off in Washington. I had no clue what kind of opposition we were going to be facing. There was a campaign of marketing and deception. We brought the signatures of 130,000 Americans with us. Regular people stood up and said, look, we don't want to take it anymore. You don't let the fire win. We win. Who are we listening to when we're being told these chemicals are safe, they work, they protect us, they are essential to our lives? Who are we listening to? So, the good news is, the amount of chemical they put in the furniture making process does nothing for fire spread. Doesn't back up one of their claims. Does absolutely nothing, and their profits. There's three main companies that make it, and their profits are in the billions. That's where we're at. So, the end of the class. I have not put every department I've been to up here yet. As I get around to it, I put one in. I put you guys in here. You know, I was coming here today. I get around. I think it's because I'm cheap. <laughs> <laughs> As a member of the, the Firefighter Care Support Network. We're a 5013C charity. We have one person who gets paid. And that's the secretary in LA. That's where we we're based out of. Everybody else volunteers. Your organization was nice enough to give me a, a gift card to cover my gas and time up here. I am very thankful for that. I appreciate 100% because you didn't have to. But I've made the commitment, my personal commitment and my family's commitment to do this. And that's stronger now than ever because people ask where I'm at. My remission lasted two years. I've been stage four for three years now. I'm styling my lymph nodes. So the writing's on the wall for me. I don't want that for you. My family has no problem me being away from them to do this message. None whatsoever. It's a family illness. You do not want to be in my shoes wondering, should I have done something different 15 or 20 years ago? 
Don't worry about it. You didn't know any better. But if you get cancer 20 years from now, you have the information today. And I don't want you to have that feeling. I should have listened to that fat, bald guy. <laughs> so, please, we all have, want to have a retirement. We all want to go to the, off to the sunset. We can get there if we change the way we do our jobs. And you guys have already started that. You are far ahead of a lot of value departments. They're living off the reputation. I love going to departments of this size because you guys are 100% self-sufficient. Do it on your own. Phoenix can't figure out how to do a hood exchange program. They're too big. They got to create a committee to see how we can activate this. You guys have simple directive done. So it's kind of cool working for an organization like this. So my contact information, you know, we save lives. We practice saving lives. We do save lives. But now it's time to save each other. Holding each other accountable that we don't have torn crotch in our turnouts. That we're in SCBA during an overhaul. We should never be a case of making fun of a new guy wearing his pack during an overhaul Why you won't. We have to embrace the changes these young guys are coming out with. Because they have the latest, greatest information. So that's all I have. Any questions? Any questions from the satellites?